And before we get started, here's a quick update about Akira the Documentary, the documentary film I'm making about the greatest hand-drawn animated movie of all time, Akira. We have found an angel investor for our project and we are moving forward. And we will also be relaunching a retooled Kickstarter very soon. Thank you to everyone who pledged to our original Kickstarter. We will be back in the coming months. Hello, my beautiful babies. Welcome to my Barbenheimer vlog. That's right. I survived Barbenheimer 2023. It was the movie event of the year. It was so exciting to see both of these movies in one day with my friend Lizzie Gordon. We went at 10.30 a.m. to see Oppenheimer and I took a break, had some Pinkberry Froyo, Barbie Froyo, and some brunch, and then came back for Barbie at 4 p.m. Personally, I preferred doing the Oppenheimer first with a Barbie chaser. The Oppenheimer is, you know, it's a very serious Chris Nolan film. And then you have the Barbie movie, which is a lot more, you know, sparkle and color, even though it's also dealing with serious issues, it does it in a way that's like more cartoony and more fun. So um, I'd love to see in the comments below how many of you did Barbenheimer this year? How did it fare for you? Did you see Barbie first or did you see Oppenheimer first? I would love to hear about your experiences. I had so much fun with my Barbenheimer outfit. I had this like brown fit with a hat and then like the pink shirt. So I like really combined the two movies into one hot look and I got a lot of compliments and it was super fun and I was so excited to see so many people happy to be at the theater and showing up and dressing up and I just I haven't seen this much excitement about going to the theater in a while it's been a long minute theaters have really been struggling so I'm very grateful for the magic of Barbenheimer and how it is helping our theaters. And I think it's also really funny like how Barbenheimer became this viral meme. You have these two movies that seem like they are complete and total opposites, like that couldn't be more different from one another. Opening on the same weekend and the absurdity of that and this just wild synergy came together and I think that these movies have both been very successful at the box office and I think they totally owe each other for their success. Like I don't think Barbie would have made as much money without Oppenheimer and Oppenheimer would not have made as much money without the Barbie movie. And I just, I love it. They're like a weird peanut butter and jelly sandwich. So on the one hand, you have a super serious Christopher Nolan three hour film based on the super serious true story of J. Robert Oppenheimer, the father of the atomic bomb, and how he came to spearhead the Manhattan Project, build Los Alamos, create the bombs that definitively ended World War II, and later how he worked against the arms race that he felt that he had created, his private downfall at the hands of a rival politician, and the public downfall of that very same politician. And on the other hand, we have a super silly pink Greta Gerwig movie based on Mattel's fashion dolls, Barbie and Ken, who live in their perfect pink Barbie land until she suffers an existential crisis. They go on a journey of self-discovery when they travel to the real world to find the root cause of her suffering. So on the surface, it seems like night and day. But are these movies two total opposites? Or are they directly connected to one another? Oppenheimer's atomic bomb cemented the United States as a world superpower and ushered in an era of prosperity that created Barbie. So without Oppenheimer, there is no Barbie. And both films deal with themes of what it means to hold power. And seeing these two movies back to back reminded me of that 
flow chart that I've seen circulating around the internet. Hard times create strong men. Strong men create good times. Good times create weak men. And weak men create hard times. A lot more, like I keep thinking about this movie, but maybe not for the reasons that they want me to think about it. Oppenheimer is a straightforward tale told in a non-linear fashion. We meet J. Robert Oppenheimer and we see his rise to power and then his fall from grace, his initial excitement over working on this project and later the regret he feels for creating the atomic bomb. And this movie is the Avengers for people who are really into scientists from the 20th century. This movie also boasts a stacked cast. You've got Killian Murphy, Robert Downey Jr., Matt Damon, Kenneth Branagh, Josh Hartnett, Dane DeHaan, which totally looked not how I remember him, Rami Malek, Florence Pugh, David Dalsmachian, Gary Oldman, and like so many, many more. It was incredible. So there's a few things that I really liked about this film. One of them being the conversation between Oppenheimer and Einstein that is shown at the beginning of the film. And it is referenced several times throughout the film. What do they say to each other? What do they say to each other? And this one guy's like, he said something to sour Einstein on me. And you think to yourself, well, what did they say to each other? And eventually you get this really great payoff and you see what they talked about. And it was so well done and I loved it. I'm not gonna spoil it for you guys, but I really enjoyed it. Another one of my favorite things about this film is Christopher Nolan's ability to translate the grandeur of cosmic and elemental forces. And he hasn't just done it in this film. I mean, there's definitely huge moments in Interstellar where it's like, whoa, you know, he really gets you into like the wonder and awe of these natural forces. And he does it so well through visuals and through auditory cues. And I love the little flashes that we see when Oppenheimer's thinking about these forces. Ooh, you know, it was just like, oh, so well done. And he says, he claims that there is no CGI in the film, uh, which if that's true, that's really cool. I like it even more. And I would be really curious to see how they achieved those effects. And I'm hoping that they would maybe talk about that on a Blu-ray extra. And this leads me directly into my next favorite thing about this movie is the sound design and the score. It's just so well done. And I feel like it's totally worth the price of admission like for a movie ticket to go see it in a theater that has like really good sound and you can really be bah, like, just like feel the bass <laughs> of this stuff. I think it's fantastic. I love it. The sound design is just like Mwah, chef's kiss and the score is like Mwah, so good. Like my ears are just so happy listening to these things, especially the part leading up to the test of uh, the first atomic bomb. So they, they've made it. They think it's going to work. They got to try it out and see what happens. And so there's just like this really great like pacing in the music of like this lead up and you're just like, oh, oh, it's just getting more and more and more stressful, you know, slowly over time as they get closer and closer to when they push the button. And then when it is detonated, like the music stops and there's like this silence and everyone's just like, oh, you know, witnessing. It was just like so powerful. It was so good. I just loved it so much. It was very, it was very well done. It was very, very well done. And something else that's really interesting to me is that if you watch a lot of Christopher Nolan movies, you will notice that there is this theme of time that keeps showing up. Like Christopher Nolan is very interested in the phenomenon of time. 
and he talks about it a lot. And in this film, time isn't a narrative theme like it is in something like Interstellar or Memento or uh, Tenet or Inception, you know, like it's like, it's not in there, but it is in there in the unique way that it is edited. Like I've never seen a movie edited quite like this, where you're constantly like jumping back and forth through time. And it's somewhat linear, but it's also not. And it's like this real mixed salad. And because of this like quick pacing of these like scenes, like this scene, and then how it leads to this scene in the future. And then this scene is from the past and that connects to this scene in the present. And like, it's just all over the place. And because of this editing and because of this pacing, the movie never feels like it drags. Like even though this is a three hour film, that's a lot, that's a long movie. That's a long time to sit. I do miss the idea of the intermission and I would appreciate an intermission, but there's no, there's no room for an intermission in this film. After watching it, I was like, where would you even put one? You know, cause the way uh, that it's edited is just like, it's, it's a, you're on a ride and you're going and you're going with it. And it just, it doesn't feel like it's too long to me. I just was like, oh, okay. Like we're on this ride and we're going. And I think it was really interesting to see like Nolan's still playing with time, but he's doing it through the editing. And I was like, all right, all right, Bob. Like I, I see you, Christopher Nolan. And just overall, Oppenheimer is fantastic. It's just, it's a great movie made by a masterful director who is supremely confident in his craft. I stand, I'm here for it. I hope that Killian Murphy gets a nomination for the Oscar. I hope that Emily Blunt gets a nomination for the Oscar. Her character of Kitty was so good. She was a tough bitch. Oh my God, she may not have been a great mom. Definitely was a great candidate for birth control, but in her time, they didn't have access to stuff like that, unfortunately, because she did not mean to be having kids. But like, damn, like, it was just, and sound design. I hope they get a nomination for sound design. I hope they get a nomination for the score. I just, and I hope, I hope Christopher Nolan gets a nomination. I think that it was so, it was such a pleasure in a world that seemingly everything's falling apart and like nobody knows what the fuck they're doing anymore. Like simple things, you know, like people have just lost the art of doing simple things to see someone who is just so good at what they do and knowing what they're doing and doing it so well. Mm, I love it. I love it. This is why I go to the theater. I love it. So now let's talk about the Barbie movie. I have a lot to say about it. Like I said, it made me think and feel about a lot of things and not in the way that I think that it wanted me to think and feel, <laughs> but it challenged me. Like this movie really challenged me in a lot of ways. And by the way, I just want to say like side note, I'm so happy that we're not in the universe that Amy Schumer played Barbie because there was a moment where she was going to be cast to play Barbie. And I just, I'm, I'm very pleased that I'm living in the world where Margot Robbie was cast in this role. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Grateful, hashtag grateful. So in the Barbie movie, we meet a stereotypical Barbie and Ken, and we witness their individual existential crises and them going on a journey of self-discovery to the real world. And personally, when the marketing for this movie first came out, I was like really hype on it because they showed this like 2001 Barbie like mashup sequence. And I grew up playing with Barbies. I love Barbie and I love 2001. I've seen that movie more than any other movie. And so to see these two things, which are both are like very influential on me come together was really special. I was like, wow, I don't know many other people that would really like love this as much as like I love this. So I thought like this movie might really be for me. Like this might be a really cool fucking movie. 
And later, I also saw the clip where Barbie's dancing, and then she's like, do you guys ever think about dying? And I thought, wow, this movie is just like gonna be a real fit for me. But after watching it, I was like, oh, this movie was not a great fit for me. Because a lot of this movie is about overcoming acquired conditioning. And what is acquired conditioning? Acquired conditioning is these kind of insidious messages that we receive from society that we all have to like unlearn at some point. Like, you know, you're told all of these different things. Oh, you gotta be this and you gotta do that and you gotta do this and you need to be this to fit in this, this box that society wants to put you in. And that box is very uncomfortable for human beings. <laughs> like it's, it's not a box for human beings. And so we all have to take personal responsibility at some point in our lives and overcome and unlearn some of this acquired conditioning. And I really appreciate this message. Like, I think it's a good message for people, not just for women. I think it's a great message for everybody that it's like, yeah, like, fuck that shit that society's telling you to do. Like, stop being a doll. Stop being a stereotype and choose to be a human being. You know, even though it's messy and it's weird and it's uncomfortable, that's a really helpful message. And, you know, I do agree that women receive a lot of very conflicting messaging growing up. I also feel like men receive a lot of weird messaging too. Like it's not just women that receive this stuff. Like it's everybody, everybody on the planet. And it's hard for everybody. Like we all have these challenges and these obstacles that we face. And yes, women have different challenges and obstacles than men have in certain areas. And, but that's not to discount the struggles that men also go through. Like, it's very hard to be a man. I don't think it's easy at all. Uh, and that's where some of like the Barbie movie like fell apart for me, is that I understand that this is a movie targeted for women and the female experience. And that's great, you know, like I don't have any problem with that. But to kind of present things like women are the only ones who deal with these issues and that everything's great for men, but women have to deal with all this stuff, you know, and men are just like these dumb Kens and like women are just like powerless and yeah, you know, it's just like, I don't know if that's true. I don't think that that's very true. And the thing that I find that's ironic about this film is that it, it goes out of its way. I mean, it even speaks about the idea of cognitive dissonance, where you have two different opposing ideas in your brain at the same time. And so it's like, if you're like a robot and you put like two, like it's like HAL 9000 from 2001. He was given two different opposing programs and it made him go crazy. So that's cognitive dissonance, right? But I feel like in the movie itself, like it has very confusing messaging that I find creates more cognitive dissonance. And so one of the things that I think is really confusing about the Barbie movie is you have Barbie land and it is a matriarchy. It is entirely run by women. All the Barbies control the government, uh, construction, they fly the planes, they are the astronauts, like they do everything. And the Kens are presented as these ornamental idiot beings who have no respect and literally no power. In fact, they don't even know where they live because like the Barbies all have a dream house, but where do they, they don't even know where they live. They, they could be homeless, okay? And Throughout the film, Ken is trying to get Barbie's attention. Like he's in love with her, he wants to be with her, and she is just not very interested in him, probably because he's not very interesting. She keeps rejecting him. He really is just kind of an accessory to her while she's like going on her Barbie journey. He's just kind of tagging along. And so while they're in the real world, Ken, who again, who's been rejected, who gets no respect, 
he discovers the patriarchy <laughs> and is like, oh, I can be respected just for being a man. Like I can get respect from somewhere because I'm not getting it from Barbie. I'm not getting it from the woman I love and I'm not getting it from the society that I grew up in. And he takes the idea of patriarchy and he goes back to Barbie land with it. And then the Kens and him somehow brainwash all the Barbies into becoming subservient, brainless people who just give them brewski beers and are the cheerleaders now while they're playing the sports. And Barbie comes back, she sees what's happened to Barbie land. And so she hatches a plan with you know the weird Barbie and they figure out how to deprogram the other Barbies. And they do this through talking about all of the cognitive dissonance things that you receive, you know, oh, you, you can't be thin or you have to be thin, but you can't say you want to be thin and you have to say you want to be healthy, but then you can't be too thin, but then you can't be this, you know, and like somehow like complaining about all these things like snaps the Barbies back and they, you know, go through and they distract all the Kens and then they pit the Kens against one another and before the Kens can vote to change the constitution to a Kendom, the Barbies take over, take back their government and the Kens have, have lost, they've lost the war. And there's a part where, you know, Madam President Barbie, a Ken comes up to her after she says, you know, well, we don't want things to go back to exactly the way they were. And Ken's like, well, then could we have one Supreme Court justice? Could we have one? And she laughs in his face and says, oh, no, you, but we'll give you maybe a, a, like a circuit court. You can have like a circuit court judge or like, you know, and then the narrator talks about like how just in the real world, like that's how like women are slowly going to like get power or something. And it was just like, you're supposed to be rooting for the Barbies to get their like matriarchy back. But I mean, if, but while also talking about how bad and unfair the patriarchy is. So if, if a, a world run by men where women are powerless, which by the way, women are not powerless. Like we're not completely without power, but this is, you know, the idea that is being set forth is that women are powerless and men have all the power. Okay, so this is bad, but then I'm supposed to root for the matriarchy, which is good because it's all run by women and the men have no power and they treat the men poorly, but this is good and I'm supposed to root for this? Like, that's really confusing. Like, that's like really confusing. And I feel like it's promoting an us versus them, you know, black and white mentality that is really unhealthy and not helpful at all. And I just, I feel like real progress is men and women working together with their different strengths to support one another. And it reminds me of this Dune quote. It was a two-edged blade. The oppressed always learned from and copied the oppressor. When the tables were turned, the stage was set for another round of revenge and violence, roles reversed and reversed and reversed ad nauseum. And that's exactly like the Kens were oppressed and then they learned from watching Barbies and then they just did what the Barbies were doing to them. And then, but then, you know, again, it's like roles were reversed and then the Barbies became oppressed and then they had to take back. And it's just like, this is exactly what Frank Robert was talking about. It's stupid. It's fucking stupid. Like the way to, like, you gotta break out of this fucking shit. And it's just like, it's so frustrating that this movie is like, that's what they're trying to say. Like, it's just like, it's so confusing. Like it's causing a lot of cognitive dissonance where it's just like patriarchy is bad, but matriarchy is good and we should, we should vote for it and we should like root for it. You know, it's just like, no, like, no. And another thought I had is like, you know, I mean, there's just like a lot of like feminist mythology, you know, within this film. And it's like really projecting a lot of these ideas and these stories 
that, you know, you're supposed to believe all these things. And it's just like, oh, you know, women aren't in power because they're being kept out of power by men. And I was just, I was thinking about it and I was just like, maybe like, cause like people like who are at the top of like, like CEOs and like, you know, the president and like all these motherfuckers, like they're there because they're fucking crazy. Like they're psychopaths, like they're sociopaths. Like to get up there, you have to be, you have to dirty your hands so much to get up there. And it's such a distasteful, awful thing. And most women just aren't fucking crazy like that. Like it sucks to be the president. I would never wanna be the president. Like what a burden, what a fucking burden that would be. It's fucking terrible, <laughs> it's terrible. And I think a lot of women are not CEOs of a top company, not because men are keeping them out, but because why the fuck would you wanna be up there? It sucks, it sucks, it's terrible. It's a nightmare. And there's another interesting thing in, in the film is that, you know, I don't know, there's like this myth of like women being powerless. And I just, I just don't believe that. Like, I just don't believe it. I think that women have a lot of power. I think they have a lot of personal power. You may have to learn how to utilize that personal power. And the Barbies in this film do. They end up using divide and conquer tactics on the Kens. They create triangles to break them up. I mean, these are all things that are taught in the 48 Laws of Power and the Art of Seduction. And if you feel powerless in your life and you want to understand the way power works and how it moves, I highly recommend reading these books. Now, they're kind of like Sith Lord literature. There's a lot of stuff in here that's like kind of feels icky and a little evil, and that's okay. You don't have to employ those tactics. Think about it as defense against the dark arts, where to be forewarned is to be forearmed. And so if you know what people do, then they can't pull that sort of shit on you. So, you know, I highly recommend these books. Uh, I think they're fantastic. I've learned a lot from them and it's really helped me to navigate in, you know, lots of male dominated industries. And there's some other things in the film that I was like kind of confused on. So one of the ways in which the Barbies distract the Kens is that they go up to a Ken and they say, I've never seen the Godfather. And then the Ken is like, oh, what? Sit down, let's watch it, you know? And he wants to explain the movie to her and like talk to her about it. And it's funny because there is a grain of truth in this. Like there is definitely like, I've had this conversation before I had seen The Godfather. Guys would definitely be like, what? You haven't seen The Godfather? And I eventually did watch The Godfather with uh, men, it was a re I was the only woman in that room and we all sat down and we watched The Godfather together and they showed it to me. And it was such a joyful, fun thing. Like I really enjoyed it. Maybe it's cause I'm a weird Barbie, but I don't see what's negative about a man wanting to share a really good movie with you, a piece of art that like means something to him and like talk to you about it. Like what's bad about that? Like what is bad about that? Like that's that's my whole job is taking art that I love and talking to you guys about it. And like, and maybe it's not mansplaining. Maybe they're just trying to have a conversation with you about art and share something they love. And it's a good fucking movie. Like I, I might understand it if all oh, men love some shitty movie, but like this movie, The Godfather is great. It's so good. And so like that to me was like really confusing. But again, maybe it's just because I really love movies and like a lot of women aren't interested in The Godfather, I guess, or something. But I was just like, I think that's a beautiful thing and I love it. And I had a great time watching The Godfather and Godfather 2 with my male friends and talking to them about it. Like it was fantastic. We had a great time. And another thing that the Barbies do to distract the Kens is like one of them sits down and she's at Photoshop and she's like, I don't know how to use this select tool. And the guy's like, oh, you gotta, you gotta select the layer, babe. You know? <laughs> it was like, 
so funny because like a i never see photoshop jokes so like as somebody who's like into photoshop like that cracked me up but again it's like isn't that great that he wants to share his knowledge with you and help you like if you are having a problem like what's what's bad about that like what's negative about that like i think like there's been so many times in my life where i'm having trouble with computer programs and i've called a dude and i'm like hey i'm having problems i don't like this is messed up can you help me and they fucking helped me and i'm like thank you motherfucker like i'm so glad you know about this shit because i don't know about all of it i mean there's other things that i know about that they ask me about and there's things that you know they know about that i ask them about like i just feel like there's so much of this like gender war stuff. And I think it's really like a divide and conquer from like the elite to like try to, you know, pit men and women against one another, to pit, you know, different uh, sexualities against one another, different uh, ethnicities against one another. And to me, it's just silly. I think it's just silly. Like, I think that we all have something to contribute. I think that there is just so much joy in men and I think there's so much joy in being a woman. And while it is important to, you know, understand the problems and the challenges and the obstacles that, that people, you know, women face, like that's important to like, you know, put a name to it and understand what's going on. But it's also important not to get lost in the sauce where you're just looking for problems and get so focused on that problem. It's like, that's all you see. And your whole life is like enveloped in like anger because you're just like mad about these problems. And it's like discounting, like you'll, you'll miss all of the magic and the joy and how awesome it is to be a woman. And I would just love to see some some positivity about it because it's not all bad it's not all bad there's a lot of great stuff about being a woman there's so many wonderful things that i love that i love i mean it's just like you know so for me to just like hear a lot of this negativity and this complaining it's a real turnoff like it's really like ugh, you know like and that's another thing that's why i feel like ken is so much more interesting and is making a bigger cultural impact because Ryan Gosling is having the time of his life playing this dumb role, like this goofy, silly role. He is just, you can tell that he's just having so much fun with it. Like when he's singing his little Ken song at the end, like I looked at his face and like, he's like trying not to like bust out into laughter at like silly and like fun and goofy this is. And like that really like shines through in his performance and like the joy that he's bringing to this is really a light that like attracts people like mods because it feels good. You know, it's like Barbie is having like a come apart and she's crying and everything is hard, you know, and like, ugh. And Ken, I mean, he has his come aparts too, but the way that it's played and um you know like even like his ending like i am kenuff like where he's wearing that stupid hoodie that i want one of those and i and i'm like i don't need one of those okay like i don't need that shit. but like i want one because it's so simple i am kenuff i am kenuff like his whole storyline his existential storyline which is like he's made as an accessory to barbie he is the the Eve to Barbie's Adam, made from her rib. And so he just wants to be with her. And she's like, no, no, no. You need to figure out who you are. Like, you're not defined by your relationship to me. Like, you need to be enough for yourself. And he's like, you're right. And it's like, that slogan is so simple and perfect and like, is very spiritual. <laughs> like, and it's like, and like, Barbie doesn't have that. Like, she doesn't have, like, I am Knuff. You know, it's just like, it's like, uh, feelings, uh, I'm gonna cry and then I'm gonna be joyful and then I'm gonna be old and then, you know, it's like, uh, it's all these emotions and all these feelings. And, you know, again, that's fine. Again, I love her ending. I'm not saying I don't like her ending. I do love her ending and I love her choice. I am Knuff, though, you know? I mean, he's like, Ryan Gosling, Ken memes are crushing it. I've saw this one about like, 
kenosis, like instead of gnosis, it was like kenosis. And like emptying yourself so that you could just be literally me. And it's just, oh my God. And Ryan Gosling has just played, like he's had such a fantastic filmography playing all of these really extreme points of masculinity from Blade Runner to Drive, Lars and the Real Girl, where he's like an incel and he starts fucking a doll. And then now he's like a stupid kid. Like it's phenomenal. Like his body of work is so interesting in how it talks about the male experience from all of these different extremes. And I just, I love it. I love it. I think he's fantastic. And I recently saw an Alan Watts quote that really hits the nail on the head for me concerning Ryan Gosling's portrayal of Ken. To spread joy, you have to have it. To impart delight, you have to be more or less delightful. And to be delightful is not some factor of trying to make yourself look delightful. It is to do things that are delightful to you. You thereby become delightful to others. So like, you know, a spoon full of sugar helps the medicine go down. And like, he is that spoon full of sugar, you know, and he has the medicine. I am Kenuff, that is the medicine. <laughs> and I just, and I swallow it. I'm like, yes, Ken, I am Kenuff too. I understand, like, this is, it's beautiful. <sighs> Another thing that I think is weird about the Barbie movie is how sexless the Barbies are. Because I don't know about, you guys, you other girls who played with Barbies, but my Barbies were fucking, like all of them. And my Barbie didn't like Ken, because not because she didn't find him interesting, but because he was obviously gay. Like the plastic haired Ken, I was like, that guy's gay. He's not into Barbie, so she's not into him. You know, so I, I would like get my friends like, you know, G.I. Joe doll, and like that was like, she's like, oh, this guy, like this guy is into pussy, you know? And then um, it wasn't until like, there was a Ken later at Hair, the Old Spice Ken. Then I was like, okay, finally, you know, like this guy, yes, like she, yes, these two work for me. Um, but my Barbies had very intricate sexual storylines. And the Barbie, and like, here's the thing about Barbie is that Barbie is like, like pre-Sims. So you know how girls like to play the Sims and like the Sims is a way to simulate interpersonal relationships and how to navigate life. And that's what Barbie was for me growing up is that it was a way to simulate interpersonal relationships. And it was also a safe way to explore sexual relationships. So it's like, oh, you're just trying to figure things out and how they work. And then you, you know, you put your ideas into these dolls. And I think that it's odd to me that like this doll is specifically sexy. You know, in the, in the beginning in 2001, it's like you have baby dolls and oh, Barbie came along and she changed all that. And it's like, you have this shift from the focus on motherhood to the focus on maidenhood, you know, and being the maiden, right? Who's getting like attracting the male and attracting the mate and being, you know, hot so that she can, you know, get fucked and then get pregnant, you know, but like, this is the, before the pregnancy, right? And so Barbie, to have these Barbies be so sexless. And I realize that, you know, this is a corporate movie made with Mattel, but it's just odd. It's just odd. It was just odd to me. It was just odd where it's like, Barbie is hypersexual. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> like, like, Barbie is sexual. Why are these Barbies so asexual? It's weird. It's weird. And if I had a Barbie that looked like Ryan Gosling, you better believe they would be together. You better believe it. You better believe it. Cause damn, Ryan Gosling looks so good. I was, I was sad they only had one scene with him without a shirt on. I was like, he was so ripped. He looked amazing. His body was banging. And we only get one short moment of him without a shirt on. <laughs> I don't like that. <laughs> like, Give me more of that Ryan Gosling without a shirt on because he looked good and good for him. And thank you, Ryan Gosling. You know, Mar Margot Robbie also looked amazing. I mean, everybody looked great, but, but I'm more attracted to Ryan Gosling. So I'd like to see <laughs> what, what plastic blob he's got underneath those pants. You know what I'm saying? 
uh, I did love the weird Barbie thing. We all did have, we I had a weird bar, I had a whole gang of weird Barbies. Cause you try to cut their hair and then if you fucked it up, then you shaved them off. So I had a whole gang of like skinhead Barbies who were like the, the bad, you know, evil Barbies. <laughs> and then the ones that I fucked up, you know? And then the other ones and like, and sometimes I had like, this is so weird. I would have the, the skinhead Barbies like form like a human chair for like their leader, evil leader, but like, it was so weird. It was so weird. And maybe it's because I'm a weird Barbie that I played with Barbies like that. Maybe other girls didn't do that. I don't know. Like I have a hard time because my experience is very different. I feel like from like the average, the average girl, you know, I just, I've had a very different experience in life, but I think it's because I have a very different perspective and you know, it's cause I just, I love, I don't know. Like I love men. I think they're wonderful. I'm so happy that you're here. I need your help all the time. You guys are so fucking helpful. I don't want to do everything by myself. I love having men around, okay? I love it. I love the infrastructure that you built. I love air conditioners. I love indoor plumbing. I love taking bath. I love my house that dudes built. I I love it, okay? I love it. I love the internet. Like, <laughs> there's just so many things. And you guys are great. And I just want to let you know that you don't have to listen to the acquired conditioning either. You know, women don't have to listen to it, but men don't have to listen to it either. And you guys are getting a lot of really weird, confusing messages too. And fuck that shit. You know what I'm saying? Cause you guys are important. You're awesome. You're generally fucking good people. <laughs> like not all the time, but no, nobody is. And I love you guys. I love you guys. I love you guys. And you know what? I love women too. And I love my female friendships. And I love that I can cry in front of them and tell them my problems and get hugs and support, you know, and just like tell them what the fuck is going on and like having a fun time together. It's just like, oh, you know, it's just, I love humans. I love humans. I'm pro human. And I want to see humans getting along together, men and women, cats and dogs living together. That's what I want to see. I think it's, I think we all have unique things that we can add and, and it can be helpful. And I just, I love you all. In conclusion, the Barbie movie bites off more than it can chew and it doesn't stick the landing. And you know, it's funny how both of these movies are really talking about power. You have Oppenheimer, which is a movie about a guy who comes into real power, you know, within the patriarchy, you know, and how it destroys his life and how it's a fucking burden and how it fucking sucks, you know, like, and how he just like comes to regret, like all of it. And then you have this other movie, which is written from the perspective, it's like this power fantasy from people who are being told that they're powerless. You know, it's like, oh, you're powerless. And so this is our power fantasy. And it's just like, I don't know, it's really weird. I think these two movies are, like I said, they have an interesting synergy. I think they're a great pairing. They really got me thinking. And you know, something I wanna leave for people too. It's like Strauss in the Oppenheimer movie, Robert Downey Jr.'s character. He said to this guy, amateurs seek the sun and get eaten. Real power stays in the shadows. You know what I'm saying? That's the Bene Gesserit way of looking at things. Bene Gesserit in Dune is a, a whole organization of women and they work from the shadows. They don't sit on thrones because being on a throne sucks and it is confining. And uh, it's a nightmare and you're putting a target on your fucking head, you know? And so these women have learned that power stays in the shadows and they stay in the shadows and they pull the strings from behind the scenes and I think that a lot of women have been doing that throughout history. And I feel like the idea of the patriarchy really discounts all of the achievements that women have made throughout history because it hasn't just been men creating society. See, society is created by men and women. And 
These women may not have their picture in the newspaper or their name in the history books, but they definitely were there and influenced exactly what was going on more than you even know. Another Dune example, Beverly Herbert. Dune would not have been written without Beverly Herbert. Beverly, in a time that it was unheard of, took over financially for her family because she believed in Frank's work and she believed in what he was doing. She was like, I will facilitate and I will work jobs and I will make money to pay our rent and buy food while you work on this because I believe in you and this is important. And so because of her sacrifice and what she did, we have Dune, one of the greatest science fiction novels ever written. That's so important. And it's like, thank you, Beverly. Thank you. And you know, people may not go on and on about her, but I fucking know. And I love you, Beverly. And it wouldn't have been done without her. And so you just gotta look behind the scenes because you can find this stuff out but you gotta look for it. So that's it for today. Thank you for watching my Barbenheimer review. I highly recommend you go out and check out these two movies. I'd love to hear what your experience was with Barbenheimer in the comments below. Did you see both movies? Did you do it back to back? How did you feel about Oppenheimer? How do you feel about the Barbie movie? I'm sure there will be some interesting discussions about the Barbie movie because it is a very polarizing film. <laughs> Oppenheimer's not as polarizing. It's just like, hey, this guy got fucked. Like, he fucking did so much and then he got fucked, you know? It's just like, that happens a lot, you know? And it's just like, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. And don't forget to like this video, subscribe to my channel, ring that bell, and feel free to support me on patreon.com slash DanicaXIX. Come to support the videos and stay for the spicy photo sets. <laughs> I love you all. Good night.